Ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to you about the primary market for municipal offerings. Everything we've established now is associated with the prerequisite rules uh, that must be met by an issuer on the revenue and on the geo bond side has now been met. And I now tell you that the document language for the information that we sent out to clients by an issuer and by Wall Street is a little bit different, but it serves the same purpose as the language that we sent out to clients from an underwriting point of view who wanted to buy into a stock IPO. What were those documents on the equity side? The red herring or the preliminary prospectus and the final prospectus? On municipal bond offerings, the document is the preliminary official statement or the final official statement. Now, why is this document called an official statement? Because it officially states the most detailed information about the issuer. So the means by which um, and the document and the language that we sent out to clients for municipal bond underwritings uh, to buy into a mini bond IPO is the official statement. The document really has another name on Wall Street. It's called a disclosure document because this document prepared by the issuer discloses the most detailed information about the issuer. In its preliminary form, it's sent out to clients when uh, seeking indications of interest. Are you with me so far? Just yeah. like the preliminary prospectus regarding an IPO for a municipal offering. And in its final form, it's sent out to a client who might want to buy into the IPO for a municipal bond to confirm sales. Now, um, I want to read to you this official statement, both in preliminary and final form, so that you can understand some of the language that we've discussed. The issuer here is the city of New York, political subdivision of the state of New York issuing municipal bonds. And the size of the par value of this bond offering is $656,378,310. Type of bonds, GO. The next type of official statement I have for you is a final official statement. Although in black and white, there's no border, so you know it must be a final official statement. I think you'll find this one interesting. This is the New York State Urban Development Corporation, uh, authorized to issue municipal bonds within its state. 245 million plus in par value. They are correctional capital facility revenue bonds to build a prison. Are you with me so far? This is a revenue bond offering. Are you with me so far? And I'm seeing something right here in black, and you can take a look at these documents at the break. Mbia. Mbia. They are insured bonds by the Municipal Bond Insurance Association, therefore qualifying that debt service, second source of revenue, for a triple A rated status. Are you with me so far? Yes. Time to go public. Let's talk about going public. So, step one, the municipal issuer prepares an official statement, both in preliminary and final form. It's sent out by the uh, underwriter to clients who might want to seek indications of interest or buy into the IPO. Are you with me so far? Yes. We talk about uh, municipal bond underwritings, and we talk about the process of going public. Are you with me? Yes. There's a different process for a revenue underwriting versus a GO underwriting. So let's take a look on the GO side of what we have. When a municipal issuer would like to issue a GO mini bond IPO, they are going to establish one investment bank on Wall Street as Series 7, a syndicate manager. The syndicate manager is the lead quarterback on this underwriting. He has the responsibility of preparing a document, Series 7, Bullet 2, called a syndicate letter, and send that letter out to invite. 50, 60, 70, if you will, broker-dealers selling group members into what is called a bidding table to bid for these bonds uh, at the IPO level. Now, these bids that are being submitted by all of these selling group members uh, are sent to the syndicate manager. Syndicate manager controls the underwriting. Are you with me so far? Yes. The syndicate manager is acting Series 7 Bullet 2 in a fiduciary capacity over his selling group. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, that syndicate letter is sent out and prepared by the syndicate manager to selling group members to invite these members in to bid for New York State Port Authority IPO bonds. Now, the bids that are submitted to the syndicate manager are called Series 7 competitive bids because these selling group members, look at me, are in competition against one another looking to submit the winning bid to win the bulk of the allocation of the IPO bonds. Are you with me so far? Yeah. As you'll see as I walk you through this underwriting process, losers in the selling group who have submitted 
unsuccessful bids still will get a piece of IPO. It's just that the winner will get the bulk of the allocation of the IPO inventory. So everybody will share in getting an allocation here. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, we'll get into that actual bid process in a moment. The point was that these bids that are being submitted are called competitive bids. Are you with me so far? Yes. And that's why the process of going public for a geo meeting about IPO is called a competitive sale. Because these bonds are brought to market by means of a competitive sale with competitive bids that are being submitted by selling group members all through to the syndicate manager. Are you with me so far? Yes. The document that binds a GEO minibond IPO process is called the syndicate letter. Are you with me so far? Yes. Know your documents that bind the IPO process. And in that syndicate letter will be what are called syndicate accounts. Now you have to listen to me. The syndicate accounts determine not only the percentage of allocation of IPO that each selling group member will receive as a result of their bid process and participation in this underwriting, but whether or not, based upon the syndicate account type, a selling group member is or is not further liable for the unsold balance of IPO of any other selling group member. Let's take a look at exactly what that means. In the syndicate letter, there are what are called syndicate accounts. The syndicate account structure of an underwriting for a GEO IPO determines the percentage of allocation of IPO that each selling group member will receive that they're going to resell to institutions or to high retail net worth clients. And based upon the syndicate account type, we'll determine after a selling group member has sold his percentage of his allocation, whether or not the selling group member is or is not responsible for the unsold balance of any other selling group member in this family of syndicate. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, the Eastern account, Series 7, Bullet 1, is called the undivided account. Equally and undividedly, these words I've been saying to you as a common theme throughout this program, means this. In an Eastern undivided account, once a selling group member has sold his percentage of his allocation of IPO that he's received, leave me so far. Yes. He is still further liable by his same originally assigned percentage for the unsold balance of any other selling group member. Equally and undividedly means that selling group members are responsible for one another's <coughs> unsold balance. Are you with me so far? Yes. The Western account, and I'll show you what that means when I take you through the trade in a moment. The Western account is called a divided account. Once a selling group member has sold his percentage of his allocation of IPO in a Western divided account, everything is divided up, that means, uh, the selling group member is no longer further liable for the unsold balance of any other selling group members in the syndicate. Are you with me so far? Yes. Do your piece, you're out of the deal. Not so with Eastern. Are you with me so far? Yes. Let me show you what that means. What happens if this, in this GEO underwriting I have a $10 million bond issue? That's the size of the bond issue. I have what is called a 10% Eastern undivided account structure. The 10% Eastern undivided account determines the percentage that each selling group member is required to fulfill and sell of IPO bonds at the IPO level. 10% of a $10 million bond issue means each selling group member has to sell a million dollars worth of IPO bonds to the market. Are you with me so far? Yes. What happens if I tell you that all members in this selling group have fulfilled their allocation and participation except Goldman Sachs? one of many selling group members in the syndicate. Goldman Sachs has a $250,000 unsold balance of Goldman Sachs' percentage of allocation. And now I ask you for all selling group members full participation in this underwriting. Now this is an Eastern account. After each selling group member has sold 10% of a $10 million bond issue, after they've sold a million dollars worth of IPO bonds, they are still equally and undividedly further liable by that same originally assigned percentage, 10% of the unsold balance of any other selling group member. If the unsold balance of Goldman Sachs is 250, you with me so far? Yes. They still have to further now sell 10% of that unsold balance, each selling group member. 10% of the unsold balance of 250 is 25,000. So in addition to their million, their full participation would be a million 25,000. If this was a Western account, are you with me so far? Yes. The answer would be A, a million dollars. Sell a million dollars worth of IPO bonds, you are no longer further liable for the unsold balance of any other seller group member. Are you with me so far? Yes. Donegan. What if there's more than just Goldman Sachs? If there's two that would have unpaid balance? That would all be equally and responsibly. So if Goldman Sachs has a $250,000 unsold balance, if JP Chase has $1.5 million of an unsold balance, they would then be broken up 10% of all the selling group members in the syndicate, further responsible for any other selling group members' unsold balance. So all of the unsold balance denominations right, are, are then shared by the selling group. Are you with me so far? Yes. Correct. Now, 
They understand, you know, the definition of an Eastern versus a Western account. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So I wrote a program for you and a transaction for you that's more like NASDAQ's experience. And this is the kind of thing that you're going to see. See, it's not as simple as this. Are you with me? Yeah. So here's your trade. This is seven now. You have a $260 million bond issue with a 25% Eastern account allocation and structure. Are you with me? Yes. Watch well, the seven. It's at a much higher level now. I further tell you that all members in this syndicate has fulfilled their allocation in this bond offering. However, the syndicate manager works for a syndicate managerial fee. That's usually exclusively what the syndicate manager receives. And the fee is quite handsome to structure and run this syndicate. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. The pricing of thousands of bonds set forth by the syndicate manager with similar bonds that are trading out there in the secondary market as a benchmark that have similar coupon rates. I mean, the staggering work. Pricings uh, could be six months alone in pricing meetings. So, so, far, so the syndicate manager usually works almost exclusively, but not in all cases, for a syndicate managerial fee and acting as a fiduciary over the selling group. But here, in this particular case on the seven, the syndicate manager is also getting an allocation. Are you with me so far? Yes. And participating in this underwriting. You've got to read deeper here. And the syndicate manager in this bond offering has a $10 million unsold balance. Are you with me so far? Yes. The following is each member's full participation in this underwriting. Those are your choices. Give me a response. A, $65 million. B, $62.5 C sixty seven five and C D sixty two two fifty. Take your time on this. What do you think? You gotta calculate this out. We're working this problem right now. You wanna understand regulation? We gotta work this together. Okay. So I got GO that says C. C's out. Take your time on this. I'm doing this for a reason. C is the normal response. You missed the concept. It's okay. That's why I'm doing this. Anybody else? A. A's out. The answer is B. Now let me show you what you did wrong. You forgot the definition of an Eastern account. Again, you make the classic mistake of thinking that you understand what I say to you. But you only hear three quarters of what I say. You've done this so many times. We can make these mistakes now, I'll say it again, but not at NASDAQ. What is the definition of an Eastern account? Each member is required to fulfill their participation of the allocation of the bond issue, and then they are further responsible and liable, based upon the same originally assigned percentage, for the unsold balance of, here's the key, here's your problem, any other selling group member. Who is that the unsold balance of? Don't assimilate syndicate managers with selling group members. They're completely different parties. Are you with me so far? Yes. A selling group member is not responsible or liable for the unsold balance of a syndicate manager, only of another selling group member in the syndicate. This is where NASDAQ gets you. Syndicate manager, selling group member, all you're seeing is Eastern, you're seeing unsold, and you're going to go for the participation, like Geo did. Here's what Geo did, because he saw unsold, but he didn't see whom it was unsold by. 25% of 260 is what? 65 million. And then he took another 25% of the $10 million unsold balance, which is 2.5 million for total participation of each selling group member of 67.5. When in fact, NASDAQ, the unsold balance of the syndicate manager is inclusive and part of the bond offering of 260 million. Geo treated it as in addition to the 260, and it wasn't, but it's part of. It has to be subtracted out because it's not selling group members' responsibility and liability. And therefore, that leaves 25% of 250, which is 62.5. Seven. Watch the seven. It'll rip you, and you don't even see it coming. That $10 million unsold balance of the syndicate manager is part of the $260 million. It's not an addition to. Are you with me? Yes. And it has to be subtracted out because it's not selling group members' responsibility or liability. It's going to stay unsold. It's syndicate manager's responsibility, not selling group members' responsibility. And therefore, if you pull out the $10 million, which you are required to, that leaves what selling group members' responsibility and liability is, which is 25% of the 250 remaining, which is 62.57. Now, let's get into revenue bonds. I want to talk to you about the path. You know we can take the path now, am I right? It took three years to get that path really up and running after September 11th. When Tower 1 imploded, not to discredit the loss of life in Tower 2, 
under Tower 1 of the World Trade Center was the entire headquarter link that uh, structured uh, and centralized the entire mass transit system uh, of our train system that got us around Manhattan. Are you with me so far? Yes. So when Tower 1 imploded, the city was crippled. We couldn't get around. It took several years to get that path up and running. That path, which you may not know, is a temporary path system. What we're going to be going for on Wall Street is a $7 billion revenue underwriting. It's going to be the biggest revenue underwriting that's ever hit the street of dreams. And it was going to be performed by Merrill. I don't know who the underwriter is going to be today as a result of a lot of consolidation on what's been going on with the banks and buying brokerage firms. But the $7 billion issued by the New York State Port Authority is issue Are you with me so far? Yes. Is going to use those proceeds to build a state of the art, completely digitalized new path system that's going to be modeled after the Japanese bullet system in Japan. They call it the bullet in Japan because it breaks the speed of sound. Are you with me so far? Yeah. To more efficiently uh, get us around uh, this great capital of the world. And I want you to know that the feasibility study and that flow of funds analysis will take years. There's no <coughs> question about that. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah. When there is a revenue underwriting that's going to be performed in the market regarding a revenue bond IPO, the issuer will tap one underwriter, one broker dealer. Let's call that broker dealer just for an example, Goldman Sachs. And the terms of the underwriting and how much money Goldman Sachs stands to make as a result of their participation in the IPO, watch this now, are to be negotiated between that one issuer and that one underwriter. There's only one investment bank and there's only one issuer. Revenue bonds are brought to market by means of Series 7 or negotiated sale. It's a different process. There is only one issuer and one underwriter, and the terms and the conditions between these two parties will be negotiated between that one issuer and that one underwriter on the underwriting process and all compensation. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So when we use the word syndicate, we think GO. When we use the word negotiation, we think revenue. Ship! The document that finds that one issuer with that one underwriter associated with the revenue bond IPO is called the Agreement Among Underwriters. Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs and the New York State Port Authority are going to sign this document called an Agreement Among Underwriters that bind those two parties regarding their participation in the performance regarding a revenue bond IPO. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, document regarding syndicate letter, GO. Agreement Among Underwriters, revenue bonds. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, I want to talk to you about the structure of a bond issue. The word structure, Series 7, means the maturity repayment debt service plan. You got to listen to me. You got to listen to what I'm telling you. When we talk about the structure of a bond offering, we're talking about not just when it matures, we're talking about the debt service payment plan. When I use the word debt service, what do you think of? You think of how, not when, how the issuer is going to repay back interest in principal to bondholders. Are you with me? Yes. There are three ways an issuer can repay interest in principal to bondholders who buy into a bond offering. Look at me. What happens if I told you Wall Street advises their client, the issuer, just to pay interest to bondholders every year who buy into the bond IPO? No principal. The principal will only be repaid at the maturity of the bond offering. Are you with me so far? Yes. Reccio. This type of bond structured debt service payment plan is called 7, a term bond structure. In a term bond structure, term, the issuer is only paying interest to bondholders, no principal, for the 25-year bond offering. The principal is only repaid at the maturity of the offering. Are you with me? Yes. That's one type of structured debt service payment plan, how the issuer pays uh, interest and principal back to bondholders to buy in the bond offering. Another type of structured debt service payment plan would be serial bond offerings, serial bond structures. Are you with me so far? Yes. In a serial bond structure, watch this one. The issuer might be advised to pay interest and some principal to bondholders who buy into this bond offering. Uh, so that each year they are paying debt service, interest and principal, so that over the life of a 30-year bond offering, when the 30 years mature, the entire debt service payment plan of interest and principal has been fully retired. Usually when a bond offering has a significant and sizable par value, like that $7 billion revenue underwriting that's yet to come into Wall Street, I assure you the New York State Port Authority will be paying interest and some principal of that $7 billion every year so that by the year of 2030, when the bond offering is set to mature, the entire interest and principal debt service payment plan has been fully retired. 
by it. So the issuer doesn't have to worry about in the year of 2030 coming up with $7 billion in principal. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So there's a scheduled debt service payment plan, am I right? Where yeah. each year the issuer is paying interest in principal, um, and so that by the time the maturity of the bond offering has been fully retired, so has the debt service payment plan been fully retired. Let's take a look at the capital correctional facility revenue bonds. Look at this. You will see that on the front page of the official statement, um, a year, and by each year a certain dollar amount of money of interest and principal are being paid of the $245 million of that par value, so that by the year of 2012, which means that this debt offering is still outstanding, the entire $245 million in principal, along with its interest, has been fully retired. You see the schedule payment plan? You with me so far? A serial bond structured debt service payment plan. What happens if in the same bond offering, some of the par value is being retired serially? And some of the par value is being retired as term bonds. What happens if in this 245 million bond offering, at least so far, 100 million of the 245 million are being retired as term bonds, where they would just pay interest every year, and 100 million of the 245 million is payable in the year of 2012, and the remainder of the 245 million it has a scheduled debt service payment plan, where each year interest in principal of that par value. Well, that portion of that part of value is being retired with a scheduled debt service payment plan structure. The combination of a serial bond structure and a term bond structure in the same bond offering is known as Series 7, a balloon bond structure. In a balloon bond structured debt service payment plan, some of the par value is being retired serially and some of the par value is being retired as term bonds. Seven. So, we either have a term bond structure, a serial bond structure, or a balloon bond structure. The structure of a bond offering is qualifying how the issuer is repaying back interest in principal to bondholders, and you'll need that knowledge for tomorrow as well. Are you with me so far? As a matter of fact, the entire day today is a prerequisite to tomorrow. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, Bond counts in a legal opinion. Just before that bond offering goes public, the issuer is required to retain the services of a bond law firm to render down a legal opinion regarding the legality of the issuer. Now, why? To protect bondholders from buying a fraudulent municipal offering. Are you with me so far? Yes. Legal due diligence. So what if I told you the New York State Port Authority, please listen to me, hires the law firm of Shea Gould, one of the largest law firms in Manhattan. Shea is Shea Stadium in Gould. Are you with me so far? And they say, Shea Gould, look, we need to hire you as our bond counsel associated with this municipal bond underwriting that is going to be coming public over the next year in the market. And Shea Gould um, performs legal due diligence into the New York State Port Authority to check out the legality to protect bondholders when they buy the New York State Port Authority bonds in this offering. And they finally have completed their legal due diligence, and Shea Gould writes down the following legal opinion. Listen carefully to the content of the legal opinion because it's NASDAQ. It is in Shagel's legal opinion after establishing legal due diligence that the legality of the New York State Port Authority is contingent upon outside liability. Is this legal opinion a qualified legal opinion or a non-qualified legal opinion? Go. Listen to what I said. It is in Shagel's legal opinion that the legality of the New York State Port Authority is contingent upon outside liability. Is it a qualified legal opinion or a non-qualified legal opinion? What is the legal opinion saying? For the legality of the issuer to be contingent upon outside liability means what? There are some pending lawsuits. Contingent upon what? Outside liability. There's future legal liabilities against the New York State Port Authority. So it's not a clean bill of health. Are you with me so far? So if the legal opinion says that there are legal issues, then the legal opinion is a qualified legal opinion because legality is being qualified subject to condition. Are you with me so far? But if the legal opinion written said that legality is not contingent upon outside liability, but rather a 100% affirmation regarding the validity of the municipal issuer, are you with me so far? Yeah. That means that it is a unqualified legal opinion. There's no problem regarding validity. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Qualified versus non-qualified, are you non unqualified? Determine whether there is a problem. Qualified, we have a problem here regarding legality. Non-qualified, no problem regarding legality. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So, we look at the legal opinion. By the way, if the legal opinion was a qualified one, it still would not deter the underwriting process. They're still going to go forward. In this industry, is all about disclosure, just to make potential bondholders aware that legality is uh, subject to condition. Are you going to be so far? As long as you understand that and that disclosure was made to bondholders, at your risk, you buy into that bond offering, but it will not deter 
uh, the uh, process of going public. Are you with me so far? We deal with the structure of a bond issue. We deal with the underwriting process and the documents that bind the IPO process. And now it comes time uh, for this underwriting to go public. Are you with me so far? Yes. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to leave the revenue bond side, come back to it tomorrow. It's rather simplified. One issuer, one underwriter, the agreement among underwriter, uh, underwriters documents that bind that revenue bond process of negotiated sale. Uh, there are many more steps involved regarding a competitive sale. Why? Because we have the establishment of a syndicate and selling group members, and therefore there are more responsibilities that are involved. Here there's only one issuer and one underwriter, so that's a rather simplified product. Are you with me so far? Yes. So we now take the following and the final <coughs> set of notes down. I'm going to give you a five-minute break and write down the following fine points now on going public and concentrate on the regulations associated with a competitive sale with a syndicate manager and selling group members regarding a GEO mini bond IPO. <laughs> Five minutes. Thank you. Brian, I did that for you so you wouldn't have, you can take your pause now and then you can take a picture of this. I want everybody writing this down. We're not leaving, all right? That was for Brian. Uh, let's write this down. Thank you. Al, uh, Non-qualified is, unqualified is no problem. Unqualified is no problem. Qualified, yeah. Give me an answer. If you give me an answer and I say, will you do me a favor, Al? Thank you for your answer. Can you qualify that? The answer is not 100% accurate. Qualified, subject to.